Hi everybody and welcome back to Cheetash. My name is Chris and today we're going to be continuing along our journey through the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. Today talking about chapter 16, how to stick with good habits every day. If you guys remember last time we went over chapter 15, which was all about the cardinal rule of behavior change, we talked about how there is a mismatch between immediate and delayed rewards because early humans lived in an, an environment where they needed immediate action. They needed immediate effects from the actions that they took because they're out in the wild. There's things that pop up. You can, you can die at any second. There's danger all over. So you needed immediate gratification. You needed the immediate effects to take place. In today's world, we live in a very delayed gratification area in in a lot of things so if we talk about saving for retirement or losing weight or the benefits of quitting smoking you're not going to notice those benefits right away like you would if you hunt down something and you have a meal if you were like an early human you hunt down something and then you eat it it's very instant but in today's world it's delayed so we talked about how last time you want to turn instant gratification to your advantage. You want to actually make sure that you reinforce the completion of a habit right away so that even though you're saving for retirement and retirement is years down the line, reinforce that that deposit of money to your retirement account right away so that it it shows your body, it shows your brain that, oh, okay, this is very satisfying and I am actually doing a good thing and I don't have to wait for my gratification years down the line. It's it's happening right now. So that was last time. Today we're going to talk about how to stick with your good habits. Again, this is all part of the fourth law of making habits or making good habits, which is, again, make it satisfying. So let's kick things off. James starts off this chapter by talking about a gentleman, Trent Dersmid, Dier, who was a 23-year-old 23, 23 who worked at a bank in Canada. He was hired at this bank in Abbotsford, around the Vancouver area. And Trent does something interesting while he's at the bank. He has two jars. He's got one jar that's full of paper clips and he's got another jar that's empty. So what he did every day to be super, super successful is he made it his objective to make sales calls. And for every call he made, he moved a paper clip to the other jar. So for five calls, he would move five paper clips over to the other jar. And his strategy was essentially to move all the paper clips from one jar to the next jar. This was called the paper clip strategy. And what James says here is that it gives you a visual cue of your progress. And again, to what we were talking about last chapter, it gives you immediate satisfaction. And it distinguishes the goal from the results. So all you're trying to do is move paper clips. But by moving paper clips, you move like a hundred paper clips, which means you made a hundred calls. Maybe some of those turn into an actual sale. Somebody actually opens an account or wants to take out a loan. That helps you and that helps your company. But you're not really thinking about that. You're just thinking about moving the paper clips. So this is a great way to reinforce the behavior. It, and it's a really good way to keep your habits on track. So another way to do this would be crossing off days on a calendar, similar to the paperclip. You have maybe a blank calendar. And every time, every day that you perform some sort of positive habit that you want, like, yeah, like, yeah you make 10 sales calls today, or you read 20 pages today, or you do 10 sets of problems from your workbook for school, you mark an X on that calendar. And then every day you're just trying to mark the X. 
I've heard Jerry Seinfeld talk about this, and James mentions it in the book where it's called never breaking the chain. So you have your red X's every day you complete a task on your calendar, and your goal is just to never break it. Try to make the longest chain of X's as you possibly can. Another another technique here, Benjamin Franklin. It was mentioned that, you know, Benjamin Franklin, I don't think he really did the the calendar the calendar method but he did write down in a notebook that he kept so at the age of 20 he started carrying around a small booklet and he went and he used it to track 13 personal virtues so these were stuff like lose no time be always employed in something useful, avoid trifling conversations. Every time at the end of the day that he would adhere to these personal virtues, he would open up his booklet and record the progress. So recorded in a journal, crossing off days on a calendar, ways to keep your habits on track. And there are some pretty glaring benefits to doing this. So the number one benefit is that you make your habit tracking obvious. And you're going to find that some of these benefits cover previous laws of a to- of habit making that we talked about, the four laws. So the first benefit of tracking your habits is that it makes it obvious, which was the first law that we talked about. So when you habit track, you build visual cues, like X's on the calendar when you've completed your task or when you keep daily logs. And when you do this, it's making it obvious and it's keeping you honest to the task at hand. But it's making it obvious what you have to do. It's a very visual, simple representation of what you have to do. And it's not necessarily, again, you trying to do the habit itself. Like if you're if you're trying to lose weight, right, all you're going to do is mark on the calendar when you do 50 sit-ups, 50 push-ups, 50 squats in a day, right? That's your goal. But in reality, once you complete the goal, you're marking the X. All you're really trying to do is just mark the X and then everything else comes with it. So it's a good visual cue makes it super obvious, hey, all I want to do is just mark the X. That's making it very obvious. And then it keeps you honest in that you immediately know the amount of progress you're making. So you can't fake it. If you look at your calendar and you only have like a couple X's spread out all over the place, so you you worked out or you trained your body like just a couple days a week, well, you're going to know. You've broken the chain. You're not being consistent. You're going to know. So that's one benefit to it. Another benefit is, again, to make make it attractive. Another law that we talked about earlier in this book. So when you habit track, it makes visual proof that you are making a difference. And it motivates you to start to start if you see an empty square when an X should be there. So it's very attractive. So it's obvious, hey, Here's the habit, the habits I need to do. I got to cross off the X. Very simple. But it also, it's it's now attractive to keep the momentum going. Well, you know, I just crossed off. I just trained or I just, uh, I haven't smoked for four days. God, I really want to mark another X. This I, I want to get a chain of five Xs. So it motivates you. It, it provides you visual proof if you miss a day. You want to get back on the train and you, and you want to get that habit going again. You don't like to see those empty spaces where an X should be. I know we're in this particular example, we're talking about marking off a calendar, but it's the same thing for a journal. If you're keeping a log or anything, you, you don't want any blank days. You don't want any blank journal entries. So habit tracking makes it attractive. And then number three, habit tracking is satisfying. It's very satisfying to complete an entry in your journal or to mark an X on the calendar. Something you know that I mentioned earlier, 
when you do this, you're making it so that you're focused on the process and not the result. All you're focused on is just maintaining that streak. And by process of doing that, you're getting better at something. You're finishing more books. You're losing more and more weight. You're going longer without having smoked a cigarette, etc. So it provides all of these uh, uh, benefits here that kind of cover previous previous laws, making it obvious, making it attractive. You're making it satisfying. But James is quick to point out that habit tracking can be a little, a little difficult. And I have definitely experienced this in the past where I remember in school, we had to track our nutrition and what we ate for like a week. And it's kind of annoying to do it. It's, it's just to be honest with you, it's, it's annoying to have to keep track of it. And then if, if you miss any sort of logging of your nutritional information, oh, well, then I got to think about what I ate the other day. And then I got to think about uh, where do I find the information for the nutrition. It just, it gets very, very annoying sometimes. It's probably the best word that I can des- describe it. Because, and as James says here, habit stacking or habit tracking forces you to do two habits. So the habit that you are building and then the habit of actually tracking it. So it can be kind of annoying for people to do this. So how can you make it easier? Well, as best as you can, automate the tracking. And there's a lot of things and tools, especially in the digital age, that can do this for you. If you're trying to save for retirement, well, good chance that your retirement provider, whether it's oh, I don't know, Fidelity or Charles Schwab or what have you, good chance that they have online tools. So you make automated deposits in there from your paycheck and you can keep track of it. You know, if you're trying to lose weight, stuff like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch can track for physical activity, track your steps, uh, monitor your heart rate. I think even track calories too. So... Automate the tracking as much as you can so you don't have to do as much of it. Secondly, habit tracking should be limited to your most important habits. So it's the habits that you want to, the the positive habits that you want to introduce into your life. The habits that you want to reinforce or change the identity that you want to have. So it shouldn't be done for just things that don't fit that criteria. So it shouldn't be done for, if I don't know, like reading a book. If if your goal isn't to read 20 pages a day, what your real goal is, is to, oh, I don't know, finish your assignments on time, then why are you tracking reading a book Every, you know, 20 pages out of a book every day. If your goal is to be a better student, well, then you should track areas that contribute to that and not necessarily reading the book. And then lastly, record directly after the habit is performed. If you guys remember, we talked about this before. It's called habit stacking, where you immediately after performing some sort of habit, the habit that you want, the habit that the positive habit that you want to do, you do it right after the habit that you already have been doing. So uh, easy example, like with the reading, you know, your, your goal is to read 20 pages a day. Well, then when you make coffee in the morning, which is a habit that you do every day, put the book right next to your coffee and immediately after making coffee, you read pages out of your book. Similarly, with tracking your habits, immediately after you're done performing the habit, record it right away. Hey, I just finished 20 pages. Boom. Right away, you put an X in your calendar. Hey, I the day's over and I haven't smoked today. Boom. Put an X right away. 
or hey, I, I just ran 20 miles, boom, put an X right away. You, you're done for the day. And that way it makes it easier in that way for the rest of the day or what have you, you don't have to think about it. Now, it will happen where maybe you do you do miss a day because, you know, we're not all perfect and we're going to have days where we just can't get to something or other things take over, emergencies happen, and we need to know how to recover and get the chain going again of not missing these habits. So James talks about how if he misses a day, he doesn't miss it twice. He says, missing one day is an accident. So you could go one day without doing your habit. And yeah, that's an accident. You know, things happen. But missing twice is the start of a new habit, and it's not the good one. When Once you start to miss two, three, four days in a row, well, now the habit can't take hold. The habit can't take hold. And now you've developed a new habit, the habit of not doing that thing. Think about it. You know, if you go five days without smoking, you smoke on the sixth day. Okay, it was an accident. Let's get back on the train. But all of a sudden you start, you smoke two days in a row, three days in a row. Well, now you're just back to smoking again. So James says, never miss twice. Never miss twice. So that's first off. Lost days hurt more than successful days help you. So in, in sorry, in, in this bullet point, what I'm saying, this was a quote from the book, where you can keep the chain going, and that's great, and it helps you a ton, but once you start breaking the chain, even if it's just for like a day or two, those days hurt more than the successful days help you. This kind of reminds me of something that Danny Kahneman wrote in Thinking Fast and Slow. Very similar. It's it's about utility. So people would rather avert a loss than have a gain. And this is kind of saying something similar to that. But the loss days hurt you more than the, the successful days help you. And Charlie Munger had a quote. It's the third bullet point there that James talks about in the book is that you never want to interrupt compounding interest. You never want to just put up a zero for the day. So James has this example in the book, you know, you start with $100, you have a 50% gain, it'll take you to $150. But you only need a 33% loss to take you back to $100. So in other words, avoiding a 33% loss is just as valuable as achieving a 50% gain. And and so the what he's saying there is that the loss is less percentage-wise than the gain in percentage. But the magnitude is just the same. So never put up a zero. Even a bad day at the gym is helpful. Even a bad day where, you know, I'm reading 20 books or sorry, 20 pages out of a book, but I don't remember anything from those 20 pages. Hey, that's even better than not reading at all. Because what you're trying to do here is you're trying to reaffirm your identity. And when you break streaks and you miss a few days, you're you're not forming that identity. You're actually forming a new harmful identity, potentially harmful identity. So even a bad day at the gym is helpful because your identity is to be a gym goer, to be fit. And what do fit people do? Well, sometimes they go to the gym when they don't really want to. So that's how to recover recover when you miss a few days. Well, how about knowing when and when not to track a habit? Because sometimes you're going to be tracking something, but it's not the right thing to track. So he talks about a restaurant in the book, and at the restaurant, if you measure your chef's skills by how much money you made, is that really going to show you how well they cook? So in other words, yes, you can definitely track this. 
you can track the amount of money you make in a day. Does that mean your chef? Does that mean that if you don't make any money that day, your chefs are bad? Not necessarily. And you have to be careful with what you track. So is it better to track the money or is it better to track how many customers finish their meal? Because if you don't have a ton of customers, let's say one day, but all the customers give raving reviews, they finish their plates clean, I think it's safe to say that the food was really good. So you have to be careful. Sometimes people focus too much on a number. So you go through unhealthy measures to achieve this number. Maybe you start working long hours. Maybe you start taking frivolous, get, you know, get rich quick or get slim quick methods that I don't think ever really work. And then you end up choosing the wrong measurement and you get the wrong behavior. You think, oh, by putting in a ton of hours, I'm going to make more money versus thinking, oh, I'm going to do meaningful work and make a lot of money, right? This is what's an example of Goodhart's Law that James talks talks about. It's named after uh, Charles Goodhart. And it basically says when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Essentially, you need to just be careful with what you're measuring because sometimes just because you measure something doesn't make it important. And just because you don't measure something doesn't mean it's not important. So sure, you could be trying to lose weight, right? And you're marking X's and you're never breaking the chain. You're staying consistent, but the number on the weight scale is not changing as fast as you like. And this could get you down. And all of a sudden, you're just hyper-focused on that number on the scale. But what you maybe don't notice or maybe should notice is that you have more energy. You're getting faster at running. You have more of a sex drive, potentially, says James Clear. And those are things to pay attention to, not the number itself. So, yes, you should be trying to lose weight. You want to see that number go down in the scale, but isn't really what you really want is to reaffirm an identity of somebody who's vigorous or has a ton of energy, right? It, you have to kind of reevaluate what your goals and object, objectives are, right? Your objective is to feel good. And yes, lose weight is a part of that. But if the scale, if you're not losing weight at the rate that you want, sure, you can start to feel very disappointed and discouraged. But what you don't notice is that, hey, there's all these other benefits that have happened from my journey thus far. So just keep that in mind. James says, if your previous measurement is not motivating, it might be time to get a different measurement. So just keep that in mind. And then lastly, here's just a summary, summary of this chapter. So Use a habit tracker to measure progress on your habits. So we learned that you can do this very simple way is to get a calendar and mark an X on the, on the calendar whenever you have completed a certain habit, or you can do journal entries. Provide clear evidence for your progress. This is what habit tracking is doing. When you do this, it becomes very satisfying. It becomes very obvious. And it becomes attractive to keep the streak going. You know, you don't want to break the chain. You want to do the habit every single day, and you never want to miss. If you do miss, we never want to miss twice. We never want to miss twice. And then lastly, measure something that does not that does not make it the end all be all. So just because you measure something doesn't mean you should just hyper focus on that one thing. Think about your identity. Think about all the other side effects that have come from, you know, quitting smoking. Yes, you miss, you miss a few days, but, or you're still feeling the cravings, but you find yourself more focused. You don't smell as bad. You're not spending as much money, etc. Think about the side effects. Don't just focus on just the number. And that's going to do it, guys. Thank you very much for listening.
we'll be back next time. We're getting close, actually, uh, to finishing the book. Getting very, very close. I think we just have a few more chapters left. So we'll continue forward with Atomic Habits. And check out the podcast. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you guys have any questions. And thank you very much. My name is Chris. This has been Chitash. Take care, everybody.